Well, I want to begin by thanking you for inviting me to join your meeting. And I want to thank you for choosing uh, this talk as one of the two that I give. This is my, probably my favorite talk to give. And I think I hope it will become very appealing to you too. It's a talk about bait hives, as you can see. Um, but let me just check in. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Very good. Great. Well, as you can see in this first slide, that it's there's a couple of things about this about put using bait hives. One is that it's a it's a good way to get locally adapted bees, and as we'll see, maybe even survivor stock bees. That's what I get with with my bait hives. Maybe that will be the case for you folks too. And um, I when I do this, I get some colonies that show the cell uncapping recapping trait very nicely. So these are often bees that are strongly uh, strongly express the VSH trait. Let's see, Tom, how do we advance here? Here's an outline of the talk. Um, we're first going to very quickly look at review the natural nest sites of honeybees, because this is the foundation for knowing what makes a good bait hive, what the bees want. Then we'll review the nest site preferences of honeybees, what they want when they get to choose their homes. We'll look then at an effective bait hive design. You'll see it's very simple. <laughs> And then we'll discuss briefly how to use bait hives. And then at the very end, I'm going to um, share with you a, a little study I did that compared colonies that were headed by commercially produced queens and bait hive caught queens. And I think it, we'll compare them particularly in terms of their ability to resist the mites. I think you and survive without treatments. I think you will be amazed, as I was. Well, one slide devoted to the natural nest sites of honeybees. They're quite different from our hives. Their entrances are high off the ground. Their entrances are small. And they live in a modest nest cavity. About It's the volume of about one deep hive body. And these traits aren't just by chance. These are the things that honey, the nest site scouts seek in a home site, a high entrance, a small entrance, and a modest sized nest cavity. Okay, so now we'll talk, uh, those are the traits of the natural nests, but now let's look at what the scout bees prefer, what the nest site preferences of honeybees are. And I'll, I'll review quickly with you the studies that I learned about this. And, and the way I did my study of what the bees want in a home site was based on looking at, seeing these photos and paintings of beekeepers in Africa that capture swarms by putting up bait hives. And in these cases, there's a log hives. And I, I saw those drawings and, and photos and I read about them in a magazine called Bee World. And I wondered, hmm, maybe we could do that here in North America too. And so in 1975, when I was just, a, I guess I was what, 20, 23 years old, I did a pilot experiment to see if, if if one put up a bait hive, what, what was the probability of its being occupied? So I went out and made a bunch of green boxes that looked like birdhouses on steroids, basically, put them up on places like power line poles, and did a, did a test run, a, a pilot test study. And what I, I put up six bait hives, and I got three out of the six were occupied in the summer of 1975. I thought, yippee, <laughs> that's good. That was, I had no idea. That was once I knew that there was a there was a reasonable probability to put up a bait hive or a nest box that bees would move into it, I wanted to. I realized that this is a, using these boxes. I could figure out what the bees want in a home. So I built that in that December of that year. I um, got seventy sheets of five eighths inch plywood and I built two hundred and fifty two nest boxes. And then in the following summer, seventy six and seventy seven, I caught one hundred and twenty four swarms and. It wasn't catching the swarms per se that was important. It was what those swarm captures revealed about the bees' preferences in a home. And the way I did this is I put out the nest boxes in pairs, and I tried to find places where the two boxes would be paired in all ways except for the difference between the two boxes. And the boxes in, in a pair were identical in all ways except for one property. It might be the volume of the cavity the area of the entrance, the height of the entrance, those sorts of things. You can see it was a pretty simple design or test of the bees' home site preferences. And well, what did I find? Well, I found that 
well, I'll explain. To, te to test the bees, whether see if they had a preference in the cavity volume, I put out nest boxes in groups of three. And one was a small box, one was a medium box, one was a big box, kind of like Goldilocks, <laughs> the bears. And uh, I, I chose these volumes, 10, 40, and 100 liters, because I knew that in nature, a 10 liter cavity was, was very rare. A 40 liter cavity was quite, quite common. That's typical bee tree cavity size. And 100 liters was, again, very rare. And what I found in this particular test with these trios of bait hives, I found that the only boxes the bees moved into were the 40 liter ones. So that was a pretty clear indication. I won't go through the statistics, but that was a very clear indication. They wanted something about this size. That's too small. This is too big. What about cavity shape preference? Well, I asked them, I was wondering, well, maybe squat versus tall was important to the bees. In nature, the cavities are tall and thin because they're in trees, but maybe that's just because they're that's the way the cavities form in trees. So I did a test with squat versus tall, and the bees said, no, we really don't care about the shape, cavity shape preference. They moved into the two without with equal likelihood. What about entrance size preference? Well, I knew again in nature that from the bee trees that their, their nest entrances are pretty small. They're, it's only about a couple of square inches, much smaller than our on our hives. So I put out boxes that had, had small entrances like they have in, in bee trees and larger entrances, larger than I found in bee trees. And what did I find? I found that they only went into these, into the boxes that it's small, had small entrances. And this is, I just want to emphasize that Every time I put out a pair of boxes, the two boxes were the same in all ways except for one trait. So these two boxes had the same volume, same height off the ground, same color, same shape. The only difference was the size of the entrance. And it was it was a night and day. They only moved into the boxes with small entrances. What about entrance shape? Well, I I, I knew from my studies of the bee tree homes that some of them are knot holes, so they're roundish, and some are cracks in trees, so they're slits. And I thought, well, maybe these are easy. These slit ones are easier for the bees to defend, so maybe they would actually prefer those. So I put up boxes with the entrances to those two shapes, everything else the same, color, size, blah, 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 shape. And I found no, no, no shape preference, entrance shape preference by the bees. What about draftiness? I thought, gosh, these bees, they, they don't want a drafty home, but I wanted to find out. And so I asked them the question. I made boxes, put up pairs of boxes. And in one box, there were lots of holes drilled on the quarter inch diameter holes drilled on the front and the sides of the boxes. And the other box, the I didn't drill any holes. So it was a difference between drafty and non-drafty. And what did I find? No preference. Now, can you guess why not? The bees taught me a lesson here. Well, if you're in a room, ah, yeah, you got it. You nailed it. That's right. When the bees moved into these ones with little holes, they just plugged them up with propolis. I don't know why they did move into this one. It would save them some work, but that, <laughs> that's it. Was a good lesson because it showed me that the bees are choosy about things they can't fix. They can't change the size of the cavity, and and so forth, or the height of the entrance. But they can plug little holes. Bees can fill holes with propolis. So this, this table summarizes what I learned about what the bees, where the, what the bees' preferences are and where they don't have preferences. For example, just to review, what's ever in blue, those are things that the bees have show a preference. Cavity volume, they want about 1.5 cubic feet. Not smaller, not a lot bigger. Shape doesn't matter. Dryness doesn't matter. Oh, and I could explain... You can guess what why I, the way I did the dryness is I put wet sawdust in the cavity, and you could probably guess that they didn't care about that because they could haul that, they could take out the wet sawdust, and they can waterproof a nest. Um, draftiness, as we talked about, they plugged the holes. They didn't care about that. Entrance area, that's really important to them. Entrance height is very important to them. Shape of the entrance is not. Position of the entrance, and they do prefer strongly the, okay, the entrance at the bottom of the cavity, and they like the cavity's nest entrance to face south. And, and these are all, uh, that doesn't surprise us. But it's nice to know that not only do we like them to face south, but the bees like the entrances to face south. And one last variable, 
they really, really, really are attracted to a cavity if it's got, if it's already furnished with combs. And that's no doubt because it saves them a lot of energy and work building comb build and the building of combs. So let's pause here and just uh, check in with you guys and folks and um, see if you have any questions. <clears throat> Yesterday we talked a little bit about like here in Iowa there's no bears. Do you think that would have uh, more bears? Do you think that would impact that height, the height preference? So that's an yeah, that's a uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, and that might well be that preference for a high entrance might well be a means of uh, avoiding making it harder for bears to detect their homes. And I, I think I mentioned in yesterday's talk that I had seen bee trees where the entrances are high off the ground. The bears didn't didn't molest the, the colony, but when the if it, and I saw one time when the tree blew over and the bears were all over that bee tree and entrance, but couldn't get in. Any other questions? Did you vary the amount of foam in the hive trap? What I did is, um, let's see, the comb, let me review. How did I do that? Yeah, presence of comb, combs in cavity. Yeah, what I did is I, I, I would, I had old combs and I could put those in, um, even, I would cut out pieces of black, dark old comb and, and wedge them into one box in, 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 in a pair of boxes. That's how I did that test. So um, when, I, when I put comb in a beehive, I'm always curious because I don't want to interfere with the ability of the, of the bee to the, detect the volume. Um, and so I kind of just put it off to one side, but I didn't know. So I only put a little bit of comb in there. I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I've wondered about that too. And apparently what the bees do is they, if they find a cavity that has some comb in it, they, they, I don't think they measure the, the size of the cavity because in a sense, somebody has told them already that this is a suitable sized cavity. It's an important point, yeah. That, but that comb is so expensive for bees to build. I think that's the over one, that's just a huge magnet for them. I think I better move on now because I know time is, is, is tight or fixed. Let's look now at, at an effective, what is an effective bait hive design? And when I started thinking about what's a good bait hive design, I, I just, use, <laughs> I'm kind of a cheapster maybe, but I just reused, I figured out, I'll reuse some of my the hives or the boxes, the bait hives that I had made for my study. So I, I put up boxes with a cavity volume about 1.5 cubic feet as you can see here, a small entrance, and I would put a nail across the entrance uh, uh, to keep birds out of it, <laughs> um, and put the entrance location near the floor of the hive. I used five-eighths inch plywood, just cheapo CDX plywood, and I painted the painted them dark green. I painted the hives dark green, and I did. I learned to do that because when I first put them up, I. I put up my first bait hives and I had some old tan colored paint and I put them up on the trees and come hunting season, they got bullet holes in them. <laughs> I guess they were just too attractive as targets for a board hunter, deer hunter. And um, so, but I learned to paint it once, once I painted them with dark green, then nobody shoot, nobody shoots them up because they don't stand out against the tree line. So that's what I did at first. I was building the boxes, but then I got smarter. I said, why don't I get these old, old hives with old combs in them? And so I would take a old uh, beat up supers. I, sometimes I nailed, up, uh, nailed them to a, uh, to a two by four type thing so I could nail it to a tree or screw it to a tree. And I drill a small entrance. I put a piece of plywood on top and on the bottom, just put a small entrance there. Those work pretty well. Um, I would also do, use just a whole hive. I would just not have to fashion a funny, funny bottom or a funny top. I just use the uh, standard entrance, standard bottom board, and standard top, and put a small entrance in them. Those both worked really well, and I'd put some old combs in them because they're Langstroth hives. But now, what I do lately is I, 
I don't like climbing up high in those trees. That I've, I've fallen out. I've fallen off a ladder once trying to carry down one of these big hives, a, a deep hive, hive body hive, uh, while walking down backwards down a ladder. And that's not a good thing to do. So what I do now is I, I don't put them high off the ground. I, I, I say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get put out my bait hives in a way that's not ideal, optimal for the bees, but it's optimal for me. So I, I put them out at kind of at, I don't know, chest height or waist height. Here's an example of one where I just put it on top of an old, old hive in an apiary, an abandoned apiary that I found. And this, and this isn't even a 10 frame hive body. It's a six frame nucleus box. And uh, it's got a small entrance and it's got a little wire to keep the mice out of it. And it's got some old frames of old comb in there and it works really well. I get a swarm in this place almost every year. <laughs> It's a, it's a really nice, it's a good setup and it's very easy to collect. Not too heavy, though, uh, as I'm sure you all know that if, if I don't collect it quickly and the bees fill up those six frames of comb with honey and brood, it can get pretty heavy. So you have to want to check them pretty frequently, which I'll like talk about in a bit. Um, so just to review, it's like, what do they, the real estate people say? Location, location, location. Well, Here's just a review. Height, 10 feet up is ideal for attracting bees, but it's a little dangerous for the beekeeper. So I don't go quite that high these days, but that's good to know that the bees like it high up. The entrance direction facing south is, is preferable for the bees. Visibility, I make them highly visible because I think wherever I put them, whether it's high or low, I know that those scout bees are going all around in the woods. And if you can make that Ne that dark opening of your nest entrance face out into a clearing, I think it's easier for the scouts to find that, that nest box because they're looking for dark openings. I've seen them. I don't even talk about this today, but I've done a lot of studies on an island off the coast of Maine where I've looked at how the scout bees behave and they're really orienting to dark openings. I keep, I like to put the nest boxes in the shade, not, not out in the sun. And here's an, a good, here's the, and I do this because I had this, I saw this experience a couple of times where a swarm would move into a nest box that was out in a sunny location. And evidently what happened is they moved in, the box got overheated, and then they moved out. And as you can see, they built their combs here. Um, they probably yeah. would have, maybe they would have been okay if they, um, if they had combs already built in the box and they could spread themselves out, but they were probably hanging in this box as a, as a mass of bees and they overheated, so they moved out. So I try to put my boxes, bait hives in shady places. And I, here's another thing, distance from the apiary. You wanna put your boxes, your bait hives out at least a hundred yards. And the reason I said this is when I started doing this, I thought, oh, I'm gonna put some bait hives you know, close to an apiary, because I know there's probably going to be a swarm or two coming from my hives, and I want them to have a handy bait hive. Well, I never, ever caught a swarm in a bait hive that was within 100 yards of, of an apiary. And I think it's because the nest site scouts know when they go searching that they really wanted, they want to look for a home that's well away from their old home, just to disperse their colony, their new colony from the, from the apiary, or at least from the old home. So at least a hundred yards from an apiary. Yeah. Okay. Now let's see. Okay, that's that's was about how to you know design your bait hives and how to set them out. But here's another question about them regarding how to use bait hives. Should you put anything inside there? Um, in my experience, the swarm lures, the commercial swarm lures work very, very well. They, they contain the citrol, the nasinoff pheromone, and they're helpful. And I think they're helpful because they make your box easier for a nest site scouts to detect. It's, they're not essential. I worked for years without them, but I do know that they, they increase the likelihood of your scout bees finding your box and then choosing it for the home. Um, and I also in the in this hive that I hive design that I use now, I do fill it. Excuse me, what have I got? Yeah. I do put in frames of comb because I know that makes the box attractive for the bees, and it makes it very easy to transfer the bees to a real hive. You don't have a bunch of 
a bunch of um, combs just attached to the walls of the bait hive, things like that. They move in and it's a very clean setup. Um, foundation, you might say, well, it may, I don't have old combs to, to put in my bait hives. Could I put in frames with foundation? I'd have to say, it probably maybe if that works well, um, because especially if if it's got some odor of beeswax to it. But I don't I don't have much experience with that. I I have the opportunity to use older combs. Okay, part four. That was what we've looked at so far is, is what how to make a bait hive and where to put it. What about inspecting the bait hives? Well, my advice in this regard is to check it frequently because it's a lot easier to take down a recently occupied bait hive than one that's still bees have been occupying for a few weeks and they might have it already stuffed with honey or at least heavily load, loaded with honey. And um, I say that because I have done that. And as I say, I, it's dangerous. I've fallen off a ladder. It's not recommended. I, one thing I do guide you though too is that you might be wondering how do I know I see flight of bees around the around the entrance of my bait half how do I know if it's just scout bees or whether it's occupied well fortunately the bees give us a very handy indication if you see bees coming in carrying loads of pollen that means there is a colony established inside your bait hive it's not just nest site scouts exploring nest site scouts don't carry pollen isn't that nice of the bees to do that for us <laughs> Okay. How often? Thank you for asking that question. How often do I go out and check them? I like to go out and check them during the swarming season, which is for us is mid-May to mid-July, basically. I go out every few weeks. Um, and what I do, actually, I'm really glad you asked that question, is I like to put these bait hives in places where I can check them when I'm driving home, <laughs> just sort of going along the road, pausing, looking at the bait hive, and then seeing if there's bees going in, it, and particularly if there's bees going in and going in with pollen. So, and, so what is it, what is it area better than, say, open field in Iowa, there's a lot of open field, yeah. next to the river, so it would be better off being well, like, Yeah, I guess what I would say on that regard, um, without quite knowing the terrain where you are, how it how it looks and feels, is you want to put your bait hives on the edge of an open area because it seems to me that's been my experience that those a bait hive that's put on the edge of a field, so where the enter the dark entrance is facing out into the field, is light is easy for the nest site scouts to find compared to one that would be deeper in vegetation. So you're probably in a good situation to put up bait hives, especially if you can. And again, you don't have to put them really high up, but um, as we saw, I, I, where I put some on just on a couple of old hive bodies. Any other questions? Okay. So that's about it. How do we inspect the bait hives? Now, how, part another part of how to use bait hives is taking down a bait hive. Well, okay, and we've touched on this, but it's good to review this because this is important. You can do it dangerously or you can do it safely. Well, first, first point, as you can see, have a smoker lit before placing the ladder against a tree if you're using a ladder. Climb the ladder, smoke the entrance, and staple a screen over the entrance. And make sure it's a screen that's not really fine because those those bees, if you've got a big colony of bees in there and you screen it off and the and you're we're working with small entrances, they can overheat. Um, so I do it at night when it's cool, for sure, when everybody most everybody's at home. Third point, use a rope. And this is something I've learned. I don't no longer I learned this by the hard way. Tie one end to secure the hive and the other end around a limb above and tied to the ladder. And it's really nice. So then you can climb down. And ideally, if you have a partner, the person at the bottom is can ho be holding the rope while you're sliding the bait hive off the platform or you're removing the nails that are holding it to the tree. So use a rope, <clears throat> remove the nails, lower bait hive to the ground, and then, of course, take it to your apiary. And you want to do it in the evening. 
or early in the morning. Sometimes the mornings even morning is is if you like to get up early, it works actually better. It's more safe because you're not working with low the light diminishing. You've got the light is getting stronger and stronger. But as you probably know, you got to get up early. You got to get up early to beat to beat the the foragers going out on a day of warm weather. Now, what I want to talk about now. Well, just check in. Are there any other questions about how to use bay times? How far? Uh, I have a commercial beekeeper who has a bee thirty-three miles north of me, three miles south. Does his hand have a tent in front of his home? Does he have a tent in front of his home? Yeah, I think the. I think if I got the question right, it was how far. <laughs> Is it appropriate or proper to put bait hives? Um, how, how far from a uh, from an apiary? Not necessarily your apiary, uh, especially if it's not your apiary. I don't have a good answer to that, but I figure that you could probably go not too too far away because if those bees have left somebody else's apiary and they're out house hunting, well, those those that's those bees are from a swarm or from a colony that's about to swarm, um, and the beekeeper won't probably won't know about it and won't intervene. So it's it's at least that's one way to look at it. The bees are free to choose their own home. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Can can you say that again, please? The bees are free to choose their own home. Yes, that's right. Yep, yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. And that's kind of a neat thing that the bees still have that um, have that ability, and we give can give them that opportunity. Yes, and they don't necessarily have to go to your bait hive; they can go elsewhere. But you know, your bait hive, if if done made according to the things I've learned, uh, it's like a magnet to swarms. Let me talk a little bit now about the benefits of getting bees from wild colonies using bait hives. And this is something I wasn't aware of until rather recently when I did an experiment. Um, I, I had long suspected that the bees I was getting from the wild were um, were highly adapted to the to the area because I was putting my bait hives up in places far from where beekeepers are. And there's, as I mentioned yesterday's talk, there's a lot of forest cover in the over the hills around where I live because it's lousy soil. It's, the farming was abandoned. Farming, at least hillside, hill farms were abandoned in the, um, by the, the late 1800s. So, uh, so there's a lot of forests around where I live and there's a lot of wild colonies out there. And I, and I bet there's, there, there may be more than you realize in, in where you are in Iowa. And what I did, is, I made a comparison of colonies that were headed by queens produced by a California queen producer versus colonies that were headed by local queens. And when I say local queens, I mean these were queens that I caught in bait hives. The colonies moved into the bait hive. I put them in a, I put each colony in a, in its own hive. But then for this experiment, I stole the colony's queen uh, for the purposes of the experiment. So both the California queens, which arrived in the mail, and my local queens were both starting out in the same situation of being introduced to a small nucleus colony. So I established two groups of colonies. And for the experiment, you want to have everything the same except for the, the column, except the source of the queens. So in this experiment, I established two groups of colonies. And the two groups of colonies were put in the same location. They were put along this hedgerow. And each, the queens were in one group, this group here, for example, specifically, every colony was set up as a small nuke, a nuke in June 2019, as was given an Oliveira's queen, a queen from Oliveira's queens in California. And the other, every colony in the other group was given a queen that was in a colony that I'd caught in a bait hive. And each colony was started out 
is the same size colony with the same resources. It was started as a two-frame nucleus colony in June 2019. And then I left all of these colonies. Each colony was left alone all summer. Then at the end of the summer in October 2019, I measured the, the mite level in each colony. And then in <laughs> April 2020, following the winter, uh, we assessed the, the winter survival of the colonies in, in both groups. So you can see it's a well-controlled experiment. Really the only difference between these two and the, and the bees were left because they started out as small colonies, two frame nukes. I didn't super them up. They had, they, they were going to, they spent their whole summer just getting, getting their nests established and getting their hives filled with honey. And they, that worked well, not, they didn't swarm. And by the end of the, by the end of fall, each colony had its nest, its hive, uh, quite well stocked with honey. So these, but what did we see? What did I see? Well, here's a comparison of the mite levels in the colonies. Uh, the colonies headed by Alavera's queens from California versus colonies headed by queens caught in bait hives in New York. And this is the units or the standard units of mites per 300 bees. And I made these measurements using the sugar shake test at the end of the first summer, October 2019. And the Oliveris queen colonies, well, these were the mite counts, mites per 300 bees, 17, 10, 4, 24, 9, 5, and 18. Now, here are the counts for the bait colonies that were headed by bait hive queens from New York. 0, 3, 22, 4, 5, 1, 1, 1. Okay, that looks different, but what was really different was the survival patterns, what I found the next spring. Winter survival, colonies were checked on 7th of April. The colonies with the Oliveras queens, well, wherever you see a yellow and with a line through it, that colony was dead. And if you see a white number, that colony was alive. So of the Oliveras queens, they almost all died. Only one survived, and it was one of the ones, it was the one that had the lowest mite count. Now, likewise, the, the bait hives, it was just the other way around. They, they all survived except for the one that had the high uh, mite count. And so survival was here was 14%. Over here was 85%. And I want to stress that these colonies were set up at the same time. They started out with workers uh, taken from colonies in the same, my, my same apiary. The only thing that really differed between them was the source of the queen the queens in the colonies of the two groups. And um, as you can see, there was a big difference in their survival. And I don't know where the queens that showed up in my bait hives came from. And I suspect this one where the mite levels got out of control, got very high, that might have been a swarm that came out of a beekeeper's hive with headed by a queen from California. I don't know. But what I do know is that when I set up this experiment and I stocked my bait hives with wild caught queens. I got good winter survival, low mite counts and good winter survival. Whereas if I stocked them with Oliveras queens from California, um, I got <coughs> high mite counts and low winter survival. And I want to stress that these Oliveras queens, they're the ones that the queen, the queen producer brags as having VSH traits. Well, I guess that might be the so, but it's not enough. VSH trait by itself is not enough to, to um, control the mites. <laughs> and we're still not entirely sure what all the traits are than these wild colonies that control the mites. But I had a student that looked at this and he said that these bees, the wild colonies, they were distinguished um, not by the VSH trait, but by being really aggressive to biting the mites. So they were real bite mite, mite biter bees. And so that's, I think that's a probably a more, uh, that's a more direct way for the bees to control the mites, but we don't have the full story. But it, what, what is clear is that the bees that I pull out of the wild, um, they, they know how, they, most of them know all about mites and how to control the mites. And because that's because natural selection has been operating on them. The ones that, the ones that don't survive a winter aren't going to 
make swarms and, and thus they're not going to show up in your bait hives. And again, I, I do take the step of putting my bait hives as far as possible from the places where I know there are beekeepers hives. Because I know most beekeepers buy, a lot of beekeepers buy their queens from like places like Oliveras. So the final considerations I want to say regarding using bait hives are these. First, the swarms that you catch are likely to consist of good, vigorous bees. Because why is that? Because, because weak colonies, as we all know, don't swarm. So you're you're getting you're catching a swarm. You're you're catching um, bees from a strong colony. It might not be resistant to varroa, but it, it's gotten to the point. At least it's in that that early spring part of the summer. It's it was a strong colony. I think it's a good way to increase the genetic diversity of your bees, um, especially if you're if most of your bees are or colonies are headed by queens you've bought from a commercial queen producer. And I have to say, I've obtained beautiful bees with bait hives. These, in other words, when I say beautiful bees, I don't just mean physical beauty. Well, that, in fact, I don't care at all about their physical beauty, but they're build up well, they um, make a lot of honey, they, uh, and, they, and they survive winters. And they're, <clears throat> they're not ornery bees as a rule. Uh, every once in a while, I get a really nasty colony, but generally, no, no. So I get beautiful bees with bait hives. And um, the capture success I've had year in, year out, over the goodness knows how many years I've been doing this, it varies from year to year. Sometimes it's like 90%, sometimes it's like 20%. The average, I went through and calculate, is about 50%. 50% of the bait hives I put up in a year um, become occupied. And last two points, <laughs> have fun. <laughs> and I've reached a point in my life, career, whatever you want to call it, I put out about five bait hives just for fun. <laughs> I don't need more bees. I don't want to, I don't try to manage a lot of colonies, but I do like to put out bait hives and have bees move in. And then I just set up the colonies and let them live uh, in, in one of my apiaries. I have to put my bees in apiaries because we do have black bears. So I have to put them behind electric fences. And nice thing is, of course, they're freebies. So, and if you're like me, it's always, you know, you can't resist something that's, that's all for, for free, basically, especially if it's bees. So just to summarize, here's the, here are the rules for capturing swarms with bait hives. It's the right box in the right place at the right time. Okay. Well, I, I hope we've got a few minutes for questions. Is, is that, and if, if so, I'd be delighted to take questions. I have a couple of questions if I may. Um, when would you transfer the bait hives into your apiary? Um, I think I, I'm not sure I got the question, but I, I try to transfer the uh, bees out of the bait hives as soon as possible. As, as quickly as possible after I cite that there are bees occupying a bait hive, just because I want to, I, the sooner you do it, the lighter the bait hive will be when you take it down. The other question I have is, um, I have several plastic roof boxes. Can I modify those and use those in lieu of, say, a super? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a great question, and I don't have any evidence one way or the other, but my hunch is that your polystyrene hives or whatever they're made of um, will be very attractive to the bees because they're so well insulated. But you, but you got to get them at the right height. You got to make the entrance small. But I, I think the bees are not, and especially if you put some old combs in it so they don't smell like plastic. And... Thank you. Yeah, well, it's a really important question because I, I don't know about you. I really like, I really like, um, well, I like to give my bees well insulated hives like those, like the boxes that you were referring to. Uh, well, the boxes I have are not polystyrene, they're just a thin plastic. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. But I, I have no use for them right now. But that's why I don't have issues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think, yeah, yeah I, um, I mean, I really appreciate your question because it it points out that is it that is an aspect of the bees' choice of their home, which nobody knows anything about. Do they actually do they like a box that in which the temperature is stable over the time they're inspecting it? 
because the scout bee comes back and makes multiple inspections of a box. And maybe it, it is more appealing to a scout bee if she, every time she comes in, it stays nice and cool versus it was cool in the morning and hot at midday and then cool again in the afternoon, late afternoon. So, but that's a, that's an aspect of the house, the nest site evaluation that nobody has studied. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I'm, I'm going now back through my memory banks, my dealings with bears. But yes, in fact, that the bait hive you're seeing right here in this image, um, it was ripped out of the one year. It was it was occupied by bees, and a bear climbed up the back of the tree. And I know it because there were claw marks in the bark and threw it to the ground and destroyed the colony of bees. And so I've learned that when I put them out in this forest, I got to check them frequently. I must, I need to check them often. Do you have, have, do most, do many of you have live in places where there are black bears? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, the, can you repeat that? I didn't quite make that out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious, can it occurs in the area to turn the bees from the bees to the box? And raccoons, scouts. Was the question about the direction? Yeah, I do try to put the entrance to face south so it's sunny. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah. All right, I'm up next to it. Um, I'm just curious if predators like skunks, raccoons, or bears deter the bees from wanting to move into the bait box. Like if they find activities from it, does it deter them from going to the bait box? Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, the only I'd have to say I I don't have much experience with the with bait hives that are off the ground and skunks. Skunks generally are, not, are just staying at ground level in my experience. Raccoons, I used to have pet raccoons. They will climb trees, but they're, but I, they're, not, they're not honey hounds like, like black bears are and black bears climb the trees. So I've only worried about, only been uh, concerned about black bears. One more question. Um, you talked yesterday about as a lure, can you use lemongrass oil or some other type of essential oil or should you use? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. In this situation where you're putting up bait hives, you want to use lemongrass oil, not anise. Anise they will associate with a food source, but you um but not with a potential home site. They don't expect their future home to smell like anise, but they but the scent of the lemongrass oil. That is the pheromone that the nest site scouts use to mark a potential home site. So you, yeah, you want to use lemongrass oil or citral. And they sell, as I, I think I mentioned, they, uh, I'll, I'll try to zip back to it. Uh, Tom, what are you doing here? What do you put in a box? These swarm lures, I know that they work. They do, so, it, so they're helpful. Um, but not essential. I know that because I did studies on an island where I would I needed to get the bees to find my nest boxes quickly for an experiment. And if I didn't put the lures in, I could wait for days. But if I put the swarm lures in, I waited for maybe an hour. And then the scout bees found them. How far do scout bees fly? How far do scout bees fly? Um, uh, I'm not really sure. I, I don't know, uh, but I bet they fly. I bet they fly. I, I would guess, and this is really just a guess. I bet they will fly probably a mile or more to search. And one thing I do know is we did experiments. Do they prefer a nest box that's near the old hive or a nest box that's near the, or a nest box that's far from the old hive, near or far? And, um, they we've done an experiment you can do an experimental test of that and we did and they prefer a distant high they prefer the distant hive 
So yeah, when when we did that experiment, we put one bait hive 10 meters from the swarm and the other one 300 meters from the swarm and they avoided uh the the, the they didn't they found both bait hives but they were more interested in the more distant one so that would suggest you want to put and this is what i do i put my bait hives well away from the uh from the apiary and i and as i mentioned they, they seemed that when i put bait hives right near the apiary I never got any occupations. So, yeah, you want to go out a few hundred yards. Does it matter if you put your bait box in a tree on top of the ridge or down the valley? Oh, on the ridge versus the valley. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. But where we are, we don't, we have... We have hills that go up to about 2,000 feet, and I've caught the bees up in those high hilltops as well as down in the valley. So I, um, so I think it, that doesn't matter to the bees so much. Closer to water versus not as close to water? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Hey, that's a good question, because water is so, so important to the bees. Um, hmm. I'm not sure. I My sense is that it probably at least in the part of the world where we are, there's kind of water everywhere, little springs and streams and things. So I don't think that bees have to be choosy, but if where you are, water sources are spotty, it might well, well be that uh, putting a bait hive uh, within a, a hundred yards of a, of a place where they can get water, a stream or a spring would in fact make it more attractive. That would be an interesting finding. These scout bees are pretty smart. Absolutely, I think. To uh, stand on that, where the swarm is forming out of, coming out of the water, you know, where it's forming out of, right? Yeah, can, can you repeat that closer to the microphone, please? I can see the, uh, the swarm that's leaving that you're catching in the bay hive. It's in you know, a spot where there's water nearby already. So that swarm is in that area, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. I have another, uh, another observation. I, I, my own personal experience with that is I've had several uh, instances, not with my own, with friends they have, where they, the, they, the bees built coal on the outside of a box. Seriously, yeah. the whole uh, swarm built their comb entirely outside the box. Yeah, I, I what, don't what think would be, what that here. What would be the reason for that? In the case where I've seen that, the one time I've seen that, it was because I had the bait hive in a sunny spot. And I think they moved in and they overheated. And then they they didn't have their combs built. They were hanging in there as a as a cluster, perhaps, and, they, and it was a hot day, and they moved out and and started building home here, and then they were stuck outside. So that's why I advocate shade with respect to shade. Put your bait hives in places that are where the box is well shaded. Thanks for asking that question. Yeah, so, the follow up on that, see, could it be too much water that soil in the box that would be, you know, they're attracted to that? Spot, uh, yeah. too much, too much lemongrass oil smell in such Yeah, that that it, that is a possibility because when you put the lemongrass oil in a box, you're really you're creating one of the bees' own signals that says, "Come hither, this is a good spot." So yeah, um, I the way I get around that is I just make sure I get the boxes in places that would be are, are well shaded. Um, cause I, yeah, I don't want to lure them into a, a place that's dangerous. Yeah. No, I so think that. What was the question again? So how much, how much money guys have to use? Because I think I use too much. Oh. I have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> someone preaches that, that I just want to go home. I said, 
true rebuffs or yeah. on the drains the themselves or on the box, inside the box. Well, you know what I would do is I would get, I would spring for, I would try to go to a, uh, you don't need much at all. You could put it on a little piece of sponge and put a drop on the sponge, something like that. Um, it might evaporate off too quickly. That's why the, with these commercial lures, they put it in this little little vial and it, they you cap the vial t shut, but there's enough leakage around there of this of the uh, lemongrass oil and uh, that, that, that it still works. So I would use I would use something if you can find some arrangement like this or put a sponge in there and because uh, and so it, it it's released gradually. And, yeah, and, and be sparing. <laughs> I've had great success with about uh, eight drops of lemongrass oil with paper towel. But the one thing I have noticed, and I don't know if you see the same thing, is do not put any honey in there. They just see it as a robbing bit, not, not as a food source. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. If you put honey in there, it's going to get robbed, and the nest site scouts are going to think this is not a place we want as a home. There's too much. This is a dangerous spot. Yeah, very good. Thank you for raising, emphasizing that point. I've, I've seen a couple articles that talk about using like a piece of ultraviolet blue material around the, the entrance as a way to highlight the entrance to scout bees. Have you ever thought much about that? I thought about that because what I have seen in my experiments is what the scouts are looking for is not something bright like a flower. They're looking for a dark opening, like a knot hole. So, and when I do my experiments on this Appledore Island, which I wish I could talk about with you guys, that's what that's what we do. We make sure that that dark opening of our nest box is is facing outward in the little lean to where we put the nest boxes, and that's. That it's like night, it's very clear when a scout bee finds it, finally finds our nest box, she her attention is drawn to the dark opening. She's in a different mode than a forager for sure, in what attract what she finds attractive. Foragers don't find dark openings attractive. They like those light, those bright UV bright objects like flowers, but not not a nest site scout. Thank you. <coughs> We have less than 10 minutes, so if you have questions, call them out. We're all going to you. One, I guess one thing I would, oh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah. Dr. Seeley, I had caught a swarm <coughs> just to the experiment and uh, I worked with that high for a year, and it was a great high. Um, my neighbor needed a, a high for pollination, so I offered this high because it was uh, a good high. I took it to the property, and it seemed to be fine, and then it became a heathen high. Personality totally changed. Wow. Um, yeah. I've never I've never experienced that before. Yeah. Um, so I, have. I left it there after pollination. Probably I'm just gonna say I brought it back home in August. Um I left it for a week. Uh, and then I knew I need, I thought I needed to clean it. But when I brought it back home, it's so uh, bad. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty I've never sure. Have you? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure what was going on there, because I had this experience similar to yours. There was a skunk. Um, skunk was visiting that hive at night, and those and those bees were just on a hair trigger in their defenses against some any sort of disturbance to the hive because of that skunk. And you probably know skunks can just sit at the entrance of a hive. They kind of knock the, 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 the bottom board or the side of the hive. Guard bees come out and then the skunks roll the roll the bees, the guard bees up. So they're, they're basically kills them and then they gobble them up. 
But that you, you can imagine the amount of alarm pheromone that's being released when a skunk is 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 feeding at a hive, and I, and the fact that your colony went back to being gentle when you moved it home is 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 a is very consistent with that. No more skunk. <laughs> So you skunked the skunk when you brought it home. <laughs> I'm glad you raised that example because it, it really, it highlights for us just how, oh, how responsive whole colonies are um, to their conditions. Uh, and it's it's very adaptive response. Uh, but it's neat to see that a whole colony gets can can get adjusted to that. And, yeah. I'm sorry, we're having the microphone problem again. I'm afraid. So you know, the older the hive, potentially the more aggressive. Be because of the protecting its brood. A young hive, a nuke, a young yeah. hive, generally speaking, yeah. are not as aggressive, right? Correct. So. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, as a colony gets bigger and stronger, it, it, it can, I, basically, I think you, the way to think of it is it can afford to invest more in defense. It's no longer living on the edge. It's got lots of worker bees. It's got its brood nest going. It's probably got the hives, the combs stocked with some food. Then it, it pays for it to invest more in, in defending itself. Yeah. It's one of the one of the attractions actually of of not working with hives that are gigantic or colonies that are gigantic. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's something to think about. And there are some colonies that you have, even if they're not gigantic, they're really touchy. And those are the ones where I usually um change out the queen because I, I don't really like to work bees that are super defensive. I was going to say, though, that the colonies that were really defensive tend to be uh, better survivors. <laughs> they, they tend to be tough colonies. So you see it. It's a choice you make. Location, location, location. So we have time for about one more question. Who wants to be the last person to say the last question? Well, I will. Can I ask the question to the audience? <laughs> how many of you have used? How many of you, or what percentage of you, have used bait hives? I'd say a good fifty percent. Good. Well, you guys, <laughs> I, I've never seen such a high percentage. That, that that's good. And what kind of, what kind of um, capture success rate do you get? Ten percent, twenty percent, more? Zero. Zero. <laughs> a couple have said zero. I heard it's twenty to fifty percent. Someone else. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's great. Yeah, good. And um, yeah, I hope you're getting good bees that way too. Yeah. Good. Well, so it sounds like there's a lot of folks there who know a lot about doing what we've been looking at today. But I hope there were a few tips in here, a few little bits of information that are it'll uh, that you find helpful All right. so I want to I want to conclude by thanking you for choosing this talk because it's one that I, I I really enjoy giving partly because it's a practical talk but also because it highlights the the complexity the sophistication of of the behavior of bees particularly of nest site scouts where they're going out searching for these potential home sites evaluating them carefully and then advertising them appropriately according to their goodness. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure.
Thank you for inviting me. I guess I should sign out at this time so you guys can get to your next event. <laughs> <laughs>